All right, thanks everybody. Um, I do hereby convene this meeting of the Conservation Commission. The first item on the agenda is the request for determination of applicability um, filed by Bill Lemon for construction of a house at the end of Gray Oak Lane. Uh, we did a site visit yesterday and Bill, if you could just give us a quick overview of what's proposed uh, for the record, that would be great. No problem. Uh, Bill Lemon, Custom Design Builders. Uh, we're proposing to construct a, a new residential home on lot 22, Gray Oak Lane, um, part of Pine Plains Estates. And if you have the, uh, if you've seen the site plan and also the site visit, you'll see that um, we tried to hold the house as close to the eastern side of the, the lot as we could. Um, with that said, some of our grading would be in the 100 foot buffer zone as you walked the property yesterday. And the closest that you will come to the wetlands is how close? Uh, well, our grading would be within the 100 foot zone. Um, estimation, I would say, is probably about 20 to 30 feet into the zone, somewhere in that range. Okay. Um, are there any questions or comments, commissioners? Nope. nope. All right, well then I will su suggest that we issue uh, a negative determination of applicability, which means that you don't need to file a notice of intent and get an order of conditions to do what you propose to do. Um, all in favor? Uh, Aye. 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 All right, it's unanimous. Um, I will uh, process up the paperwork and put it in the town offices for your tonight so that if it, you folks can get down there and sign it tomorrow, we can try to get it in the mail on maybe Friday or Saturday. Okay, Any uh, is there any time frame once we get it for uh, public to, to review or anything else? Or I, I, I didn't know if there was a 10 day waiting period or if that's- Yeah, there's, uh, a, there's a 10 day waiting period from when we issue this order, uh, this determination. That's 10 business days, so that's two weeks. But any work that's outside of the hundred foot buffer, you can do. You okay. can start immediately because you're outside of our jurisdiction. So okay. only that only applies to those portions that will be within the buffer zone. Understood. And last question: Are you look? I think you went over it with my father yesterday on site. But are you looking for any kind of uh, erosion control or anything else? I just don't want to miss anything. I know you said there was no order of conditions. That's the only reason why I asked. Yeah, we. It came up yesterday during the site visit, and it looks like based on the terrain, there really is no purpose to putting in erosion control. Okay. You're far enough away, and it's flat, and there's actually some higher ground between where you'll be working and the and the wetlands. So, yeah, there's no requirement for that. Okay, very good. I, I mean, I said that. We didn't actually agree at the meeting on that so if anybody from the commission thinks otherwise this is your chance to speak up i agree <laughs> no, i agree to no disagreement <laughs> all right so um it's as quick as that you're all set um okay. i'll get you the paperwork um and i think i i'll just use the address from the uh the request that you made and okay. then um you know you're free to start work outside the hundred foot and then you know Give it two weeks, maybe starting Monday, and then you'll be free to to do the work in that small area of buffer zone that you're going to be intruding into. Okay, and I'm going to uh, I have some of the application underway as far as the building permit, so I don't know if that's automatically sent over to you for your uh, your online. Yeah, I I got that. I I just have to go online after this meeting, and I'll sign off on that. Excellent. All right. Very good. Thank you all for your time. Okay, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. That's it. Hi, Naomi. Hi, Meredith. Hello. And here comes Ken. Gosh, my camera is so close. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
All right. Well, we have to stall for another four minutes because I officially uh, advertised the public hearing for 710. So I guess while we wait for that, um, maybe the commission can evaluate the minutes from our last meeting and approve those. So um, are there any comments or corrections uh, on the minutes from our April meeting? No. The draft no. minutes? They were good for me. Yep. Look good. Look good. All right. All in favor of accepting the minutes from our April meeting? Aye. 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 All right. So that didn't use up much time. Um, I don't know if we have any other um, any other business. I guess the one thing I could relate is that I did get contacted by people that working for VHB, and they're doing some <clears throat> work for the state about housing, um, and they, I guess they're going from town to town and looking for any sort of idle town land that might potentially be dedicated for housing. And so they're looking at the old DeMaio site um, on five and 10. And uh, so they wrote to me to ask about it. And I told them it's sort of tough. The, the delineation comes right up to the edge of the cleared area and the septic system that's there is non-compliant because it's too close to the wetlands. So they asked if I'd meet with them. So we had a meeting and they're not actually developing the site. They're just sort of doing a feasibility study for the state that on whether there was any potential for doing multi-unit housing on that site. And I indicated that if they were inter interested, they could come to a conservation commission meeting and, and, and put their ideas out for the whole board to uh, provide input on. Uh, but so I don't know what's gonna come of that, but I just thought I would let you know that that happened earlier this week and we may hear from them again. God, do you know if they've talked to the Housing Commission? I suspect that they have, because I know that um, that Brian was CC'd on all of our email communications. So I know that the town administrator knows about it and seems to be read in on it. Uh, so I imagine that, that the Housing Commission either knows about it or is going to know about it shortly. Okay. It's possible I missed an email. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I was surprised that when, I, when I got the email, I thought it was actually somebody who was going to propose multifamily housing or mostly multi-unit housing. And I thought that's nuts, uh, but it's just a feasibility study. So I, I imagine their feasibility study will probably say that it's nuts as well. Um, but who knows, it might be possible as long as they don't mind really small units, I guess. All right, somebody else coming in. All right, we got one more minute before the public hearing starts, so we'll begin shortly. All right, by my clock, it says 710. So we'll open the public hearing uh, for the notice of intent that was submitted by the Tritown Beach Commission for control of uh, aquatic vegetation in the swimming area at the Tritown Beach. We did our site visit for this project yesterday. And at this point, I'd be happy to yield the floor to any of the three of you who would like to describe the project. Right. I think Meredith, you want to Meredith, do you want to start off with a description of the resource areas? Even though I know there was a site visit yesterday, and then we can go into the approach. Yeah, I'll just. Um, so I'm Meredith Bornstein, wetland scientist at SWCA. Um, just so the public knows, the site is located at 40 Old State Road, um, on the border between Wheatley and Deerfield. And as Scott said, the Tri Town Beach Commission is the applicant. Um, so we filed a notice on of intent on behalf of the Tritown Beach Commission to treat Elodia canadensis, which is um, common waterweed. 
um, in a 1.3 acre piece or a section of the pond. Um, the pond is about 16 and a half acres. And if I can share my screen, I can just show you the figures so people have a some All right, let me make you a co-host and then you can do that. Okay. All right, I think you should be able to share your screen now. Oops. Can everyone see my figure? Yep. Okay. So just to go over the resources, so why we filed with you guys in the state um, was because <clears throat> there are two resources at this site. The orange outline of the pond is the bank resource area, and then the entire pond bottom essentially is considered land underwater. Um, this red outline is to show the um, vegetation management area. And so we're proposing about a little over an acre of impacts to land underwater. And I'll just show you, um, this is just another image uh, showing the vegetation management area. Um, within the greater pond. Um, I also have another image showing, so we mapped the vegetation out there as part of our surveying and trying to figure out um, the site and what we we're gonna do. Let me see, Don't, I think I have to stop sharing and then reshare, hold on one second, this other figure, ah, where did it go? I love Zoom, but then there's always these little, here we go, glitches, okay. So this figure is showing the extent that we found um, water weed throughout the pond. So we didn't find it in the deepest section, but it's basically forming a monoculture throughout. So um, that's important to note as far as impacting wildlife habitat because we're proposing 1.3 acres of essentially impacts and we're going to, the remaining pond is still gonna provide the same wildlife habitat. So um, just to show you guys that we did get out in the boat and do some sampling and Naomi can talk more about that. Her team um, was out there a couple times last year. And I don't know now if you wanna talk about the treatment we're proposing, Naomi. Sure. Um, so for your notes and the record, Naomi Valentine from SWCA Environmental Consultants and the Ecological Restoration Team Lead for our office in Amherst. So my team went out and did the survey that Meredith just uh, talked about and did find that it was more, the LODO was more or less covering the entirety of the pond. Um, there were a couple other species that were growing up in there, but it was by and large the Elodea, and it was taking up the entirety of the swim area, which um, Ken could speak to a little bit more of the history there, but hasn't historically been too big of a problem in this swim area, uh, which makes us hopeful that it'll be fairly easy and uh, straightforward to manage. We went through a few different options after doing that survey for the Tritown Beach Commission and landed on the use of uh, diquat herbicide because it seemed like the most feasible way to manage the area and the other options were not really realistic from a um, cost perspective. So a couple other options that could have been considered, well, well, that were considered were benthic barrier use. That's used predominantly for smaller areas. So something in the scale of like an acre or more, it's very difficult to successfully and um, consistently smother in a submerged aquatic plant. It's just difficult to keep that type of barrier down and in place. Um, and to maintain it would be fairly time consuming and could be expensive. Um, the, another option could be some sort of dredge or hydro rake, which again would have some cost limitations. And also the Elodea can spread via fragmentation. So it's not always a fantastic way to try to manage it. Um, not that there's a problem with spreading it throughout the pond because it is literally everywhere else, but um, herbicide application was ultimately 
decided on in order to get the results that we were looking for. We had gone back and forth and if we wanted to file this as an ecological restoration limited project or just a standard filing. And I know that was something Mark Stinson said in his comments. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, we decided that it was such a minimal impact on the habitat potential within the pond and wasn't dramatically improving the entire water body's habitat um, quality. And so we decided to file it as a traditional filing. Um, I could see the argument though, and Mark has often made those comments to me in the past when filing projects like this, that it is acting as an invasive plant, which is a type of ecological restoration limited project. And we would be creating a slightly more diverse habitat being that there's only a very small amount of open water available within the pond throughout the year. Um, the management approach would be to reduce non-target impacts as much as possible. So targeting the vegetation when it's very small earlier in the growing season. Um, the Elodea probably was not really up when you went out to the site yesterday, but it will very quickly start to grow really around like 10 degrees Celsius is when it starts putting out shoots and growing. And the method would be to avoid any non-target vegetation present either by treating earlier in the season or later in the season when uh, non-target vegetation has begun to die back or already completely gone to seed. Uh, we'll have to determine the exact avoidance methods with natural heritage, but that'll be taken care of outside of this process. I feel like I've been talking for a long time here, so maybe we can entertain some questions. <laughs> Um, so in terms of the limited project question, um, so Mark suggested possibly thinking about it under 1053-3H, um, which is maintenance of beaches. Um, but oh, I didn't catch that detail. To me, it looks like it might fit better under 1053-3L, which is uh, construction, reconstruction, operation, or maintenance of water-dependent uses. Uh, and in the definition of water dependent uses, you know, public beaches are listed as one of those water dependent uses. So, and then when you go to the, the guidance document that they have for uh, managing nuisance aquatic vegetation, it also references 1053-3L. So at this point, you might want to request that we review it under that provision, and then you don't have to worry about documenting wildlife habitat. Yeah, we could certainly do that. Um, I forget what the filing deadline is for the environmental monitor, but it's right around the 15th, I think, so we may have just missed it. You have to, is this something you need in uh, ENS, or was it environmental notification, ENF? To, nope. Uh, no, just only notifying that it, it's a project being filed as an ecological restoration limited project. But that's not a it's not a ecological restoration limited project. That's oh, just, just a, a limited regular, project. Straight limited project. I hear you. Yeah. Okay. You're so right, you can just verbally that. ask us to, and we can then treat it that way for the rest of the public hearing. Uh, yeah, I think having missed that that was the way he had referenced it i agree with your assessment scott i think it might be best if we request to consider it as a limited project okay um so we did receive comments from dep uh the first three or the first two out of the two out of the six of them have to do with that limited project issue that we just talked about uh, the first one has to do with something that we touched on yesterday, which is whether the Tritown Beach Commission is considered a municipal entity for purposes of waiving the, the fee. And, you know, on my reflection after our me meeting yesterday, I feel more confidence that since it's funded by the two towns to act on behalf of the two towns in maintaining the beach, that it should be considered a municipal applicant and that the fee should be waived. So uh, I'll just check and see if any of the commissioners have any thoughts about that or, or whether you disagree with that. No, that sounds fine. I don't disagree. Me neither, that sounds fine. 
Yep, that's fine. All right. Um, this co comment number four is please also note that the use of use of benthic barriers or hand pulling can be approved by under a determination of applicability. But at this point, that's not being proposed. So that's of limited re relevance unless you want to change your mind. Uh, no, I'd agree with you. And it says the commission may still use the guidance for aquatic plant management in lakes and ponds as it relates to the Wetlands Protection Act, which is this guidance document that I mentioned. In review of the project, Appendix A of that document has sample special conditions. So I've looked through the sample ones, and there's two or three of them that we should probably consider for this. Uh, but we can go through that a little bit later. Um, but a relevant related to that is this uh, item number six is that an annual WMO4 permit must be obtained for use of herbicides in a water body. It wasn't clear to me whether this is a permit per project or if it's a license to be an applicator. Mm -hmm. uh, per project per year. Per project per year. So you will have to apply for that as part of this. And so one of the conditions that they recommend is, is that we um, that that you give us a copy of that once it's issued. That sounds very reasonable. And so that's that's all of the comments from DEP. Um, and I guess I'll just see if anybody else, any of the other commissioners have any questions or comments at this point. How is the uh, herbicide applied? So we were proposing some sort of low pressure backpack because it is a backpack applicator because it is such a small area. Um, and that would be applied right at the surface or it could be uh, the wand of the applicator could be dipped just below the surface. But the idea is that you're very close to the surface of the water body. Um, there are other applicated applicator types that you could use, but with such a small area, it seemed like the most appropriate proposed use. And and you're proposing just for this year. Um, do you anticipate that you would need to do this again next year or um, in the future? Well, I'm actually we're not sure if we'll be able to get approval from Natural Heritage in time to treat this year. So it might be something that would commence next year, but if it goes more smoothly than um, their usual time frame, <laughs> they might be able to be this year. But the the request was for an as needed five year permit, so it's not something that you would apply as a pre emergent. It doesn't have pre emergent tendencies, and it's not something that you would apply before vegetation begins growing up. It, it's a contact herbicide, so it would need to be reactionary and only be used to the extent necessary. And because it is uh, fairly shallow through that area, and the idea would be to target the Elodea when it's fairly young, um, hopefully within a, once it reaches about a foot or so, uh, we'd be able to reduce the amount, the concentration of herbicide applied. It could even be as low as a quarter, a quart per acre or up to one gallon per acre, but I don't think that would be necessary for this pond. And as far as you know, has, um, so I assume this process has not been carried out in the past. Um, has the, uh, has this vegetation been treated in any other way in the past? I don't believe so, but I'll let Ken introduce himself and respond to that. Okay. Yes, I, I'm Ken Cutterback. I'm on the Tritown Beach Commission. Um, thank you all for your time this evening and. Nice to meet you finally, Naomi, <laughs> face to face. Um, the the uh, Elodia has not been treated in any way in the past. Uh, basically, it's been essentially feels like a harvest, uh, getting the weeds that are floating on the surface out of the swimming area so people can swim there. And um, anything that uproots in the course of the day um, is is taken out of the water and disposed of. So um, no, it hasn't, it's never been treated. So. <clears throat> Can you speak to the safety of the herbicide given that it's no longer approved for use in the European Union, please? 
Sure. Um, it is approved by the state of Massachusetts through the um, process that DEP and Natural Heritage go through um, in set for use in sensitive areas. And obviously aquatic use, that's what its purpose is for. It does have a very high affinity for vegetation and sediment as well. So it quickly binds to uh, suspended sediments as well as vegetation within the pond. And in natural settings, its half-life is actually quite quick. And once it is bound to those things, it does stay bound fairly tightly. And those byproducts um, do not have effect on any of the organisms that need to be tested through the EPA testing process. So um, let me just make sure I don't misspeak. Again, I can talk about the hold times associated with application because they are very short. Um, let's see. If it were to be applied to drinking waters, there'd be a three-day hold time, which sort of gives you a sense of how quickly the herbicide works its way out of the water. Um, there is no hold time for fishing and swimming, uh, one day hold time for livestock and domestic animal consumption. And if you were to be using it for irrigation purposes, you would want to wait five days. And so I know that doesn't necessarily get to your exact question, mm -hmm. but in terms of recreation, there's no hold time. So the impacts to humans at the label restricted application rates um, is considered negligible. We usually suggest a day just because, but it's not required under the label. Um, and so by all accounts, the organisms that need to be tested have very little to no impact. And those are at the upper, testing done at the upper ranges of the label use concentrations. And we're proposing a very, like a, a quarter or less of those testing limits. And so I, I don't want to understate it. It is an herbicide, but mm -hmm. um, fairly safe for use in the broad scheme of herbicides that are approved for use. There are more you want to say, George? Uh, no, 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 um, no. So I, I just want to share with you, I'm going to share my screen. Um, there's a document that another document that was is on the DEP website. So some years ago, I don't remember how many years ago, but um, you know, there were so many applications for controlling nuisance vegetation that they uh, they did this huge generic environmental impact report on lake manage lake and pond management, and I believe Paul Godfrey. Uh, from the Water Resources Research Center at UMass may have been the lead author on that, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. And so they come through the literature and they sort of essentially tried to determine which were acceptable practices and which were not. This publication that I'm showing now, hopefully you can see it. Yes. Um, this is a, a companion guide to that GEIR and it's got a nice um, section that talks specifically about this uh, particular um, herbicide. So, so I can uh, I can email this out to commissioners if you'd like to have a copy for yourself. But you know, there's all this information about how diquat works and various different benefits, detriments, information for proper application. Etc. But then down here towards the end, there's um, specific impact specific to the Wetlands Protection Act, which is pretty handy. So it says, in terms of protection of public and private water supply, that it's neutral, it means neither improves nor degrades uh, water supply. Protection of groundwater supply, neutral, no interaction as diquat is absorbed, adsorbed to soil particles. Storm damage prevention, neutral, no significant interaction. Prevention of pollution, generally neutral, but could be a detriment if plant die-off causes low oxygen at the lake bottom. Uh, and as we talked about yesterday, because Elodia is an annual plant, it dies back every year anyway. So 
uh, even normal growth could cause uh, low oxygen conditions if there's you know high biological oxygen demand under the ice. Um, for protection of land containing shellfish, generally neutral, no significant interaction, but reduced algae might reduce food resources for shellfish. Uh, and direct toxicity is possible under unusual circumstances, but essentially there's there's just no land uh, containing shellfish in that borrow pit that we're talking about. Protection of fisheries, possible benefit for habitat enhancement or possible detriment if it reduces food sources or loss of cover. Um, in this case, there's lots of other places where fish can get cover. And it might be one of it might actually be a benefit in providing nesting opportunities for sunfish and bluegills, uh, because otherwise there's no bare ground in that in that pond anymore for them to nest. Uh, protection of wildlife habitat, possible benefit if it's habitat enhancement, possible detriment if it alters food sources or loss of cover. But that's just a summary of the eight interests of the act that we're responsible for and. This is a summary assessment of the potential impacts of DICWAT on those uh, interests. So I just thought I would share that since it's directly related to what we do. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> we mentioned the GIR in our submission as well. And if there needed, if you wanted there to be a special condition referencing the guidance in there, that would be appropriate. Any other questions or comments from the commission? One random question for me. If you find that this treatment works on this limited area, do you think you'll expand the area so there's no like regrowth into that into the smaller treated area? The treatment area was planned to have a buffer from what's strictly considered the swim area for that reason. But I could let Ken respond to that because that's not something that we had discussed. I don't want to speak for him. Um, the, the commission has not discussed expanding the treatment at all, um, beyond the swim area. The intent is to, um, not impact the rest of the pond and to just provide a quality swim, swim environment for mm -hmm. the people that use, utilize the beach in the summer. Okay. So. <clears throat> All right, if there are no other questions or comments from the commission, I open it up to the general public. Anybody who would like to ask questions or make a comment? All right. Um, I guess what we should do is consider whether, um, well, I guess if there's no other information, I guess, I'll ask again the applicants if there's anything more you would like to say before we close the hearing and consider an order of conditions. Nothing from me. Nothing from me. All right, yeah. and then I propose that we close the hearing and consider the issuance of an order of conditions. Uh, so commissioners all in favor of closing the hearing? Aye. 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 All right. And uh, I guess the first question is, should we uh, permit the projects? And so uh, let's put that up to a vote. All in favor of issuing an order of conditions with the appropriate conditions that would permit the project to go forward? Aye. 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 Are you a no, George? George? No, no. Yes, that's correct. OK. You want to address that? Uh, it, 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 it has to do with my uh, own experience with pesticides and uh, uh, ones that were permitted uh, until they weren't. Um, mm. Things like malathion, chloridane that I worked with early in my work. And I, I know this is not a, a dioxin, but I've also traveled extensively through areas of Vietnam several times that were uh, heavily treated with herbicides, including Agent Orange, but also Agent White, Purple, Blue, all the various uh, 
versions of that. So I'm uh, reluctant to introduce any or any herbicides um, into a water supply like that, uh, despite what what assurances I may get or see. Um, we, we've had too many of these things uh, seem okay until they weren't. And the fact that uh, it has now been taken out of approved use in the European Union is, is a red flag for me. Um, and I uh, am not quite understanding either why the weed has become a problem, given that this uh, this particular body of water dates back to the building of I-91. Um, and we haven't, uh, there has been no treatment until now. Um, so that's that's it, just a no vote. And I, I just wanted that on the record. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to try to convince others of your point of view that yeah. Does anybody want to reconsider their vote on this? Um, I wanted to ask, um, I think we might have, somebody might have asked this when we were at the site visit, but do you think it's growing more because people haven't been swimming in it for a few years? So swimmers have, you know, disturbed that area and that reduced the, the uh, growth in the past? How about, how about if I suggest that we reopen the hearings just so we can have further discussion? That. Okay. Okay. All in favor of reopening the hearing? Aye. Okay. Aye. So go ahead. Anybody would like to address that question, feel free. Ken, would you like to address it's, it? Sure. I can I can try to address it. Um two years two or three years ago, back in 2018, I think, when the beach was last open. The vegetation had gotten to the point where um, it was not, I won't say encroaching, but it was being disturbed elsewhere in the pond and blowing into the swim area. And since the, the beach has been closed, we, we didn't see that last year uh, in our first year of operation. But I did see at the start of the season that the um, Elodia had pretty much overtaken the entire swim area. Um, it was uh, when we started in the spring, it was right, it was there. I mean, we had to clear basically six to eight feet into the water and uh, just almost in essence harvest it to get an area where people could walk in and enjoy the beach. Um, and it over the course of the summer, it did get, I think it got uprooted and, and you know, lessened but the previously they were literally starting the day off by essentially taking vegetation loading it onto paddle boards and bringing it to shore so that it would they could keep it out and there had been a snow fence installed around the outside perimeter of the area so i i think over the last two or three years maybe the growth hasn't been as significant but um We'd like to make sure that we're not, that it's not there in the beach area. Um, so it affects the quality of the, 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 the water and in the enjoyment. I know that um, Diane Kolakowski, another commission member is on and she swims pretty frequently at the beach. So um, I don't know if she'd have any comments on it, but. Does that answer your question? Well, well, I just want to clarify. So in the past, oh, I just found a tick on myself. That figures. Um, <laughs> in the in the past, um, people would pull it out by hand. Are, are you um, saying that's it's what actually they, raked? They it was raked. We, we uh, the guards will rake and and clear the anything that's come in overnight, and uh, you know try and clear out as much as they can. Uh, to get it away from the get away from the beach area, so that people can get into the water without getting, you know. And that was Ken. That was the disturbed floating yes. masses. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, that's yeah. what I was going to ask is for clarification that Elodia is a rooted plant, but right. if it becomes uprooted, then it can get blown into areas that mm -hmm. where it's not yeah. hadn't been present. And that's what you're clearing out, right? Yes. It's, I mean, I, I assume that's what it is because there's no disturbance taking place anywhere else on the pond. So maybe during the days when people were swimming, it was getting uprooted and blowing you know, if the prevailing wind was going the other way, it would leave the area. But it, if there was a shift in the wind, it would start coming back in uh, if it was uprooted. So, I could just add that it was sort of the expectation that since the Elodia has been present within the pond for quite some time and when the swimming area was open, wasn't much of a problem at all that if we're able to manage it when it's quite small and um, not yet grown to quite the extent that it is everywhere else in the pond, that once the normal use of the swim area uh, resumes, that hopefully it will not need to be managed again, or will at the very least be at the same level that it was before, which is more manageable. George, if I were to try to make a guess at the to, to answer your question about why it's become a problem now after all of these years, is that because this is a burrow pit, yeah. I expect that when it was first excavated, it was pretty nutrient poor, mm -hmm. and you know only water source is groundwater. There's no streams yeah. that flow in or flow out, and so it may have taken a while for the elodia to become established, and then it. My guess is it probably spread slowly at first, but then it began, as it died back, it was a continuing source of nutrients that was just cycling sure. in the pond. And now it's much more of a eutrophic system, uh, whereas before it was an oligotrophic. Right. And also it could be that the that it, it's been a lot warmer lately. You know, the, the climate change is giving us warmer summers and I wonder if the warm water also may be contributing to its spread. Um, so anyway, I just thought I would I would hazard a guess at that based on my limited knowledge. Sure, that makes sense. You know, the, the way the regulations are set up is, um, you know, what things that qualify, projects that qualify as limited projects, the expectation is, is that the commission will permit them with conditions unless there's an extraordinary circumstance in which you can say no. So you can say no if it's a particularly sensitive resource uh, and it's just you can't risk the harm that might come from a limited project. Or if the impact of that project, that proposed project is way out of proportion to the purpose for which it's being done. So uh, an example that I often give of that is, you know, it's a limited project to be able to cross a wetland in order to get to buildable upland if there's no other access. Uh, but I remember on the coast seeing somebody who built a causeway out to an offshore island and built a house on the island. And to me, that would have been a, an impact that's out of proportion to what sure. the purpose of sure. that limited project was and that it, they could have by rights denied that. So. For me, looking at this is it's hard to see a reason to deny it, given that it is a limited project. And from from a point of view of the of the fisheries and wildlife habitat, it doesn't seem to have negative impacts. That doesn't um, that doesn't mean to minimize your concerns, George, because the history, as you recounted, is certainly true. And you know, one of the differences about Europe compared to the U.S. is that they they use the precautionary principle to guide a lot of their decisions about what to permit and what not to permit, where the burden of proof is on the manufacturer to prove that it's that it's safe rather than trying to say that, uh, you know, well, we've done enough work that we think it's safe, but you have to prove now that it's harmful before you can take it off the market, which is the way we tend to operate in this country. Right, right. Um, so anyway, that's just to put the, the, the regulatory context around uh, this application. Sure, understood. Any other comments? 
All right. Well, let's vote to close the hearing again. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And then it will repeat the vote uh, to issue an order of conditions that permits the project to go forward. All in favor? All Aye. Right. All Aye. opposed? I'll, stop. I'll abstain. That's... You'll abstain? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of special conditions, uh, let me read the ones that I would suggest that we include uh, from this um, standard, the one that they have. One is uh, the applicant or his or her designee shall obtain a valid Bureau of Resource Protection WM04 permit for application of aquatic herbicide uh, and copies the permit shall be submitted to the Conservation Commission prior to initiating any treatment. So you want to include that one? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, another one is all application of herbicides approved for use by this order shall be applied by an applicator licensed in the aquatic weed category by the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources, Pesticide Bureau, and application shall follow all product labeling directions. Now we Absolutely. could include that as a condition, but that's actually a requirement already yeah. of other regulations uh, and other laws. So it's up to you folks if you think we should add that in as a as a condition. Why not cover all our bases? <laughs> okay, I can cut and paste. That's easy. <laughs> um, another one is um, in the event of any fish kill within. This water body applicant and licensed applicator shall immediately contact uh, DEP's emergency response section and the Department of Fish and Games Westboro office. I think it's unlikely, but you know, when we talk about biological oxygen demand, it, you could end up in the springtime when the ice melts, finding lots of dead fish. And it's useful to know when that happens. So I would I would recommend including that condition. Okay. Thank you. And then uh, the last one that I think is relevant is uh, refueling, servicing, and repair of motorized watercraft and service vehicles associated with surveys or treatments shall take place at least 100 feet from the boundary of the resource area. Um, and there's a whole bunch of additional uh, verbiage that goes with it. Equipment operators shall be prepared to immediately respond to and contain accidental releases of fuel, motor oil, or aquatic herbicides, on-site absorbent materials shall be maintained for use uh, in containing accidental spills and, and then reporting them if they occur. So, um, so you think we should include that one too? Sure. Sure. I don't think they'll need it, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> Naomi, do you know if that's something that they generally do anyway. In particular, I'm thinking about the absorbent material. Do they generally yes. have that on hand when they do these applications? Yes, it's definitely best practice to have spill kit equipment with you. Um, I can't think of any operation that wouldn't have that with them on site. And I'm, I'm sort of picturing that the application would be via boat. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Small. I don't think it needs to be gas powered. Just a little trolling motor. Um, so I think those are the ones that are most relevant. Um, does anybody have any other conditions that you think would be worthwhile to, for us to include? All right. Having heard none, uh, then I guess the, the final vote to take is to, um, to issue this order of conditions with these four special conditions that I just read off, uh, that the, the, the WM04 permit be submitted to us before application, that it only be uh, applied in compliance with other laws and regulations essentially by licensed applicators, um, that any fish kills be reported and that any use of chemicals, you know, for refueling, servicing, repair, be done uh, more than 100 feet from the resource area. All right, 
So I have a question, Scott. Yeah. Do they normally uh, post for the public when when the herbicide's been applied? Is there? I mean, it's a good know. question. I so mean, it's good that I would think somebody might want to know that if they're going to go swimming. I, I know my my time to speak is technically up, but that's a pretty common condition. I think it'd be reasonable to add. So, I mean, I know like when you do it on a lawn, you have to post signs. When you do it in the water, is it required to post signs or? Uh, there's no strict requirement by law, but again, common practice, best practice. Okay. And you and you said it's a three day wait for or you said now nothing for swimming. It was three day for three days for water drinking, right? Three no. days for drinking at the higher. It's actually two days at the rate that we were potentially proposing, or one day. But you could have the signs up for one two days. Definitely at the time of application for sure, and to be removed maybe twenty four forty eight hours after. Um. So I guess my my inclination would be to have a condition that says that the the tri uh, the tri town beach commission will develop uh, some kind of approach for for notifying users of the beach when herbicides have been applied, and that that notification be there up for what say a week. So you don't have to close the beach, but you should at least let people know that an application had been made. Um, that's a suggestion. Feel free to push back on it if you think it's unreasonable. Um, I don't think I'd push back on it at all. I think if you put it in the order of conditions, it makes it that much more evident for successors to the current commissioners if the current commissioners aren't serving anymore, that people know that this notification needs to be done. And we'll try and notify before it takes place and we'll have signs up when it has taken place. That, ma that makes sense to me. Okay. I don't, I don't know about a week. If, um, if it's safe to drink after two days, there's definitely gonna be people who are not gonna swim in there for a week after, you know, while the signs are up. Do you know what I mean? It might be, yeah. might be overkill. I agree. I think it's, it, but it, in some ways, it's good to let the public know and let them decide what's overkill. So, you know, somebody might show up on the fourth day and not know that an herbicide had been applied, and then get upset because if they had known it, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have swam, or they would have waited longer before they swam. So, it's one of those things where if if you have a notice up, people can make their own choice. If the beach is open and the notice is up, then Clearly, it's allowable to swim. It's just up yeah. to people whether they choose to swim. Okay. I didn't mean to talk. I didn't mean to sort of argue you down. I'm just sort of yeah. explaining well, what I was thinking I, when I said a week. <laughs> I used to take my kids there, and and if. And if I saw an herbicide application sign up, I would not go, I would not let them in the water until that sign came down. Yeah. Well, hopefully we can do the treatments before the swim season starts, so. That would be ideal. <laughs> yeah. Or after. Or after, yes. Although I, I think that Naomi was indicating that it makes sense to try and get it early if you can, as opposed to later in the season. Right. As it, in essence, as you've noted, it's an annual, so it dies off in the fall anyways. So, um, yeah, my hope would be that we'd be able to treat prior to the swim season starting. Naomi, were you going to say something? Um, I was just going to suggest that signage could include a date and a little line about information from the label. But yeah, I was, if your proposed condition yeah. was for the commission to come up with signage, I think that sounds appropriate. Right. That was my thinking is that the beach commission can decide 
<clears throat> how much reassuring language you'd like to have on there, what kind of qualifiers you want it to say. So I, we don't want to mandate something that's going to scare people off, but right. if there's a way um, that you can just let people know that this beach is treated and the last treatment was on this date or something like that, and whatever you decide is, a, is right. an effective way to communicate that, uh, I think I'm happy to leave that in your hands. Okay. I agree. All right, so that makes for five uh, special conditions. So if there's no further discussion, then let's have a vote that we will uh, attach those five special conditions to the order of conditions uh, that are already part of the, the form. Um, so all in favor? Aye. 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 And you're going to stay uh, abstaining, George? I'm, I'm staying abstaining, yes. Yes. OK. Um, all right. So in that case, I think that we are finished. Um, we will write up um, the, the forms. And I'll include that form down in the foyer of the town offices for signatures uh, later today. And then as soon as we get enough signatures, we'll get it in the mail and sent out. Who should we mail the original to? Um, you can mail that to SWCA so that we can take care of filing it for Ken. Okay. And should I put it to your attention, Naomi, or to Meredith's attention? Um, you can put it to my attention. Okay. Any last questions or comments? I just wanted to thank you all for your time and efforts on our behalf. So appreciate your your actions. <laughs> well, we appreciate you maintaining this amenity for the townspeople of Deerfield and Waitley. All right, uh, thank you very much. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. And for the commission, we'll just move on to the next agenda item, which is other business, if there is any. Uh, does anybody have any other uh, any other business or observations or questions that you want to talk about? I oh, I know what I want needed to bring up. Next month, I'm not going to be around for the third Wednesday of the month. So the question is whether you would like to meet without me or whether you'd like to reschedule. And then we're going to have that same familiar problem in August. So I'm wondering if we can pick alternate dates if you would like to do that. I'm also perfectly happy for you to meet without me and, and, and handle whatever comes up. I've also got a conflict that, that uh, night in June. Okay. Yeah, earlier or later would work, you know, which is good with anybody else. Yeah, so we could go with either the 14th or the 28th. Yeah, in June, yeah. It also doesn't have to be on a Wednesday. <clears throat> if, uh, if, if the Wednesdays are no good, we can shoot for another day of the week. I, either 14th or 28th would be would work for me. I can do those also. Same here. Yeah, fine. Okay. And and uh, it looks like there's no Zoom meetings for those dates either. So that means the Zoom account would be available. So it could be a flip of the coin. Does anybody have a, a gut feeling of which one's better? Let's do the 14th and get it over with. Sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. And then in August, um, I am, I cannot do the 16th or the 20th. I can't do the 9th, 16th, or 23rd. So it would either be the second, which would be about two weeks after our previous meeting, or it would be later uh, on the 30th, uh, which would be at least three weeks from the September meeting. So how does how does the 30th look for you folks i can do the 30th yeah it seems okay for now yes i can do that i'm good with that all right 
So I will notify the people at the town offices to change the dates on the calendar to show that we will uh, be meeting on June 14th for our June meeting and August 30th for our August meeting. All right, I'm glad I remembered to bring that up because it looks like both George and I would be missing in June. Yeah. All right, I think we may be out of business. Um, it's 8.01, so we put in an hour, so that's a pretty good work for, for this month. Um, and we'll see what comes in for next month. I have no idea what might be pending or might not be pending uh, between now and then, so we'll see. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Have a good thank night. You. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.